Hello all, and welcome back to the Art of Climate Modeling. In today's lecture, we'll be wrapping up the course, explaining some of the details of the operational models being employed today, and discussing future directions for climate modeling. Global climate modeling is widely viewed as an important endeavor, as GCMs are powerful tools for understanding of the processes that shape the Earth system and the changes that may occur within the climate system in the future. Worldwide, there are dozens of global climate models that have been developed by a number of national and international organizations. Within the U.S., there are more than seven models that are used for scientific understanding and to shape policy. Major U.S. federal agencies, including NOAA, DOE, NSF, NASA, and the EPA, all have their own in-house models which are optimized for addressing questions important to each of these groups. Many of these models also participate in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, which is responsible for understanding what impact climate change will have on the Earth system, and publishing regular climate change assessment reports. Throughout this course, you have come face to face with the decisions that need to be made when designing a new climate modeling system. And hopefully you have learned along the way that there are few wrong choices when it comes to model design. Climate modeling is hard, in part because there are many equally good choices. Different choices can lead to climate models that are all equally legitimate approaches to modeling the Earth system. Some models may excel for certain variables and in certain regions, while underperforming in others. Indeed, structural uncertainty is significant, and so to evaluate it and subsequently remove it from the calculus, it's important to include as many structurally different models as possible. Consider the figure on the right from Lauer et al. 2017. Here we see the root mean square error for a number of global metrics laid out on the y-axis and for a number of CMIP-5 global modeling systems laid out on the x-axis. On this plot, lower scores are indicative of better relative performance, with a score of, for example, negative 0.2 indicating that the model has an error 20% smaller than the typical model, model error for that quantity. While most of the models show a combination of strengths and weaknesses, there are two columns where performance is almost universally positive, found at the far left of this diagram. These two columns represent the model mean and the model median. That is, combinations of individual model simulations that yield a new estimate for each metric. In general, we see that the model mean and median are more skillful approximations to the real climate than any individual model result. This is because, while individual models can have positive or negative bias on any given field, by averaging across models we can average out the structural uncertainty and focus purely on the natural variability. This result suggests that having a number of models, all taking different approaches to simulating the climate system, allows us to remove structural uncertainty and obtain deeper insights than any single model could provide. Thus, the diversity that exists within the climate model ecosystem is an indisputable strength. Let's take a look for a moment at the decisions that have gone into the design of some of these global models. This will give us the opportunity to review some of the different approaches to modeling we've discussed throughout this course. The focus in this course has been on the Community Earth System Model and its Atmospheric Component Model, the Community Atmosphere Model. It now includes five dynamical cores, including the spectral element dynamical core, finite volume dynamical core on a regular latitude longitude grid, finite volume dynamical core on a cube sphere, model for prediction across scales, and Eulerian spectral transform dynamical core. While they all solve the hydrostatic primitive equations, each of these has strengths and weaknesses. The spectral element dynamical core is one of the slower die cores, but supports high order accuracy and parallel scalability. The Eulerian dynamical core is fast and accurate, but only efficient when employed on just a few processors. Three of these dynamical cores actually employ pressure coordinates and floating Lagrangian surfaces in the vertical, which is not a particularly common design decision among global atmospheric modeling systems. For those dynamical cores that use this design, each layer is effectively a two-dimensional model with vertical transport and diffusion achieved via remapping in each column. The CAM spectral element model, which employs the home dynamical core, also supports completely unstructured quadrilateral grids, which can be generated in effectively any pattern. The plot on the right here shows one such grid where the refinement criteria uses a map of the global land surface. The MPAS dynamical core employs a staggered finite volume method on an icosahedral grid, or more generally a centroidal Voronoi tessellation which primarily consists of hexagonal cells that are uniformly arranged to cover the sphere. 
It staggers velocity and mass variables so that mass is represented as a cell average and velocity is placed on cell edges. As discussed early in the course, such a configuration has desirable numerical properties and avoids checkerboarding effects related to co-located variables. Notably, MPAS also supports variable resolution via its centroidal Voronoi grid, where grid spacing smoothly transitions from regions of coarse spacing to regions of fine spacing. The finite volume cube dynamical core has been recently connected with CAM and is now the dynamical core of the NOAA Next Generation Global Prediction System. It is known for its computational performance thanks to a set of highly optimized numerical methods at its core. It also employs a floating Lagrangian coordinate in the vertical and a third order finite volume method on the cube sphere grid with an Arakawa D grid staggering in the horizontal. On the topic of grid staggering, the Colorado State University USIM model also avoids issues with checkerboarding through the employ of completely different velocity variables. In particular, rather than storing the components of the velocity vector, the USIM model stores the relative vorticity and divergence of the flow as cell averaged quantities. This has been shown to have good theoretical performance. In fact, many global modeling systems now use meshes consisting of hexagonal grid elements, including the OLAM model, which is employed primarily by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. OLAM supports both triangular and hexagonal cells, as shown here, and supports variable resolution through its grid generator toolset. OLAM is also one of the very few modeling systems that support cut cells in the vertical direction. As discussed in our lecture on vertical discretizations, this means that grid cells actually intersect with topography. This allows the model to avoid issues with deformation of grid cells near topography. The NICAM model out of Japan also makes use of an icosahedral grid, but with an A-grid staggering and a low-order discretization in order to optimize computational efficiency. As a result, the grid spacing can be pushed to its limits. With model resolution as a primary focus, NICAM has consistently broken records for its simulations at fine grid spacing. Recent simulations have actually been conducted at global uniform grid spacing below one kilometer. On the other end of the spectrum is the endgame model, which is the model currently employed at the UK Met Office as part of its unified model. Endgame is designed for use both as a climate model and as a weather prediction model, and consequently some concessions are needed. In particular, support for NWP means that the model must meet certain standards when it comes to model runtime, while simultaneously requiring high accuracy. As a consequence, this model is built on a strong theoretical foundation for its numerical methods. The model employs a C-grid staggering in the horizontal on a regular latitude-longitude grid, and Charney-Phillips vertical staggering. A fully implicit iterative scheme is employed for the non-advective terms, which does mean that the scheme is not inherently conservative and hence requires a posteriori correction. Another model primarily designed for weather forecasting is the Integrated Forecasting System, or IFS, which is employed by the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. The IFS uses a spectral transform method on the latitude-longitude grid. It runs multiple daily forecasts at finer than 9 km grid spacing, including a suite of longer-term forecasts. Since the inception of the model in 1983, the IFS has maintained a surprisingly consistent architecture, with regular updates to improve model performance and reduce grid spacing. However, with computational limitations becoming increasingly problematic, a newer finite volume model is now under development to replace the IFS around 2030. The IFS does not exactly use a regular latitude-longitude grid, but avoids the accumulation of grid points near the poles by employing fewer longitudinal points when approaching the poles. The resulting grid is known as a reduced latitude-longitude grid. The reduced grid boasts 30% fewer grid points than the regular grid, while maintaining the same grid spacing in the tropics and subtropics. The reduced grid can thus be thought of as a different type of quasi-uniform mesh based on the regular grid. The GEM model also makes use of a modified RLL grid, but one modified in a completely different manner. The GEM model uses what is known as a yin-yang grid consisting of two identical subsections of an RLL grid that are twisted to cover the whole sphere. In this image, the red mesh is identical to a regular latitude-longitude grid, but is cropped poleward to 45 north and south and cropped between 135 east and 135 west. 
The removed portion is then replaced with a twisted RLL section. The resulting mesh is again quasi-uniform, but requires remapping between the yin and yang grids. In the vertical, the GEM model uses a modified Charney Phillips grid, where horizontal velocity and pressure are stored at half levels. The other variables are staggered as shown in this image. There are theoretical considerations that make this possible arrangement desirable, as argued in the paper describing the GEM model. If you're interested in more details on the design decisions made for some of the atmospheric dynamical cores employed in global modeling systems, check out our paper from the 2016 DC MIP workshop, which is available at the link here. Okay, let's wrap things up and summarize what we've learned over this course. Going back to the very beginning, we talked about how atmospheric models were originally developed for predicting the weather. But from these roots, it was immediately clear that they also provided an effective means of understanding the general circulation of the atmosphere, and subsequently the whole Earth system. Global atmospheric models, climate models, and Earth system models have been used as predictive models on timescales of days to weeks, primarily for numerical weather prediction, or up to centuries for long-term climate projections and paleoclimate research. Both standalone and coupled modeling systems have been used as virtual laboratories for studying the Earth system, exploring the past and future climate of the planet. And perhaps most importantly, they have been used to understand how climate change is impacting our planet. Earth system models consist of many interwoven parts and incorporate a vast amount of knowledge that we have accumulated around the Earth system. The process of discretization enables us to represent the whole atmosphere on a computing system, but leads to a delineation between resolved and unresolved scales. At the resolved scale, dynamics is captured by the dynamical core, which solves the discretized equations of fluid motion under appropriate approximations. At the unresolved scale, we have subgrid scale parameterizations which capture processes such as surface fluxes, turbulence, convection in clouds, microphysics, and radiation. Additionally, we have other components of Earth system models that were not discussed in detail in this course, including atmospheric chemistry modules and component models for ocean, ice, and land surface. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of different decisions that can be made when designing atmospheric modeling systems. Often, there is no right answer, but many equally valid choices. This has led to the diversity of modeling systems now employed across the world today. Efforts like the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project, or CMIP, continue to enable global modeling centers and their respective modeling systems to contribute to our global understanding of the Earth's system. To learn more about climate models and how climate models are contributing to CMIP, you can check out the video at the link showed on this slide, entitled, A Short Introduction to Climate Models. CMIP 6 is simply the most recent iteration of this project and incorporates a number of experiments relating to paleoclimate, clouds and circulation, regional phenomena, ocean, land, and ice, impacts, future scenarios, decadal prediction, geoengineering, land use, the carbon cycle, chemistry, and forcing. It aims to use global climate models to ask questions such as how does the Earth's system respond to forcing? What are the origins and consequences of systematic model biases? And how can we assess future climate change given internal climate variability predictability, and uncertainties in scenarios. It involves a hierarchical set of simulations that enable model calibration, evaluation, and intercomparison, which then build into specific experiments. Global climate and Earth system models have become increasingly complex over the past 60 years. This is a trend that is not anticipated to end anytime soon, as we continue to seek a deeper understanding into all aspects of the Earth system. Although computational power has increased exponentially, we have had no problem meeting that capacity through more complex models, more ensembles, and finer model grid spacing. This has enabled us to reduce uncertainties, better understand the interactions and feedbacks that exist in the Earth system, and better capture fine-scale processes and extremes. On the topic of ensemble simulations, Multiple large ensemble runs are now coming online, consisting of many similar simulations with the same modeling system. For instance, the CESM2 large ensemble has been slated for release in mid-June 2021 and will include 100 members over the period of 1850 to 2100 using CMIP-6 historical conditions and SSP-370. 
The differences between ensemble members arise from slightly different initial states and are chosen to sample across oceanic and atmospheric contributions to climate variability. This promises to be an immensely valuable resource for deepening our understanding of the global Earth system. Projects like the CESM Large Ensemble and the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project have driven explosive growth in the number and amount of global climate data we now have available. While this data has provided immense insight into the climate system, storage of this data and processing of this data remains an ongoing challenge. Many different strategies are now being investigated for exploring the wealth of climate data now at our disposal. Okay, that wraps things up for today. I hope you've enjoyed learning about the art of climate modeling and the many ways to design global climate models. If you have any questions or suggestions, feel free to contact me directly or comment on this video. See you next time.